Cinema 5D stage at Photo and Adventure. Hi, welcome from the Cinema 5D stage at Photo and Adventure 2019. Um, yeah, our day is well underway. Um, and now we have Philip Bloom again. Who is this? Where is he? Um, talking about the GFX 100 and shooting a documentary you made in Greece. I did. How did you know that? I think I've seen something yesterday. And I finally got you to watch it, even though your girlfriend watched it when it came out. Just saying. Okay, I'm gonna <laughs> let you start it now. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll be back in 45 minutes, so good luck. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hi. Hello, everybody. Who here has seen my film that I'm talking about today? Uh, good that you're, you've seen it and you're here. Yeah. So, okay. Well, it's, this is gonna be a mixture of, as, as a talk always should be, creativity and technical because there's no point being uh, actually probably in my early career I was just creative I didn't know anything about uh, technology because when I first started off I was in Newt's and I just had one camera and one lens and I just used it I didn't know anything really about how it worked why it worked why you, this lens did this and this did this I just did it and I learned to tell stories which was great and then when I became a freelancer, that was when I started to learn much more about everything, about um, how it worked, the optics and size of sensors and all that sort of things. It's when I fell in love with um, larger format video. But I've skipped ahead because there is a real beginning to this story. And the real beginning to this story is here. That's me on the left there about 40 years ago. And that is a film camera. Who here has shot with a film camera? Anybody? You have? Really? Who speaks English here? Who understands English? One, two, three. The people who didn't put their hands up are either busy, he's an excuse. You, uh, you speak English? A little bit, okay. Well, enjoy it. I've got some nice images, so you can enjoy those. It's fine. And it's, everything I'm saying is complete rubbish anyway, so don't worry. So that's with my sister and my dad, and I, uh, I still have this camera. It's not very good, fixed aperture, but it was film. And do I still have the photos? Probably not. But I, this is where I first got the photography bug. And actually, I was going to become a photographer when I was, actually no, when I was first looking at getting, becoming, getting a job, I probably went through, it's changed now, but back in my time it was, um, you know, fireman, uh, policeman, uh, astronaut, were kind of the three things you'd look at. Now it's like um, uh, influencer, reality TV star. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what it is now. But, <laughs> but for me, it was, I didn't get to do any of those. So I was looking at something, uh, doing something that I enjoyed doing, which was photography. And I actually met, I wanted to do press photography because I, I saw a documentary about a, a press photographer and I was like, that is the most amazing job. You get to go all over the world and do all these amazing stories. And I thought, that's, that's incredible. And I met with him, so this would have been about 1987. And he told me, don't, don't get into stills. Don't get into photography, it's, it's dying because something called digital is coming in and it's gonna change everything and it's, everything's gonna get cheap and everybody's gonna be a photographer. I'm like, oh. And he said, you should get into video. I'm like, oh, TV news. And I went, yeah, I like TV news too. And that's how I got into TV news. There you go, true story. Moving on. So, cam but photography has always been a massive thing for me. And also a love of medium format. Um, it's just more expensive. Uh, for starters, which is a pain when, when you're developing it all, but it's just that look. It's always been a, about a beautiful look for me. Um, and I've, I have a lot of medium format stills cameras. I have a lot. Maybe, well, it depends. I, mean, I don't know, is 12 a lot? No, not really. They all work. They, they're all vintage ones. Actually, almost all vintage ones. It depends if you count one that is 10 years old as vintage. Probably, these days. So, here, this, is for, this is key, this camera. This is the Pentax 645N stills. 
a medium format. And that's a selfie, really, because it is. It's a media game. A cool selfie, not a selfie. And film, film grain, etc., etc. I love this camera, but it adds up. It adds up the cost of getting the... I didn't develop the film myself because it's color, it takes, it's difficult. Uh, I got a digital one. So this was 19... Uh, 19. 20, 2014, the six, Pentax 645Z. Look how much bigger it is than Sony A7S. I mean, it's absolutely massive. And I carried that thing around everywhere I went, all over the world, taking photos whilst I was shooting video, the TV documentary series. It was ridiculous. I'd have a big F, a Sony FS7 and all other kits and a two and a half kilogram camera hanging around my neck. But you know, it was worth it. You know, I got to take some amazing stills around the world. And, and then I got the Fujifilm uh, GFX 50S because it was a little bit smaller. The advantages weren't huge for me, but the images were great. It, it was nice to have a, um, an EVF. And, and it was also new lenses was, was kind of key. And I think the reason what, what got, made me want to get this was I wanted a wide angle lens for my Pentax 6 or 5Z, but it was so expensive. It was like two and a half thousand pounds for a wide angle lens. And I was like, oh, that's too much money. I think there's more than that. It was like 4,000. I was like, there's no way I'm spending that I, when I could get this and, and start a whole new line of lenses. So I got this, I got the 23 millimeter <clears throat> and this lens here, which is magical, which is the 110 mil F2 and loved the Fuji. I really love the Fuji and it took some great stills. That's Noodle. Uh, this is Harriet, who is actually quite important to what the story's about, but one more shot of Noodle there. And Severus, who was also key to this film that I'm gonna be talking about. And there's a nice close-up of Harriet there, to show you there. So I love medium format photos, but, so okay, I was going around the world with a Pentax around my neck, a video camera. And this camera here, shoots video. Wouldn't it have been great if the video had been any good? Because it wasn't. It wasn't good. And so when I took the GFX 50S out to shoot, to take for photos, which I did all the time, I also took my Sony A7R 2 or 3, whatever it was at the time, with me, with completely different lenses, which is always a pain. It's bad enough taking two bodies, let alone two bodies and two sets of lenses. So I... Not, not being able to shoot video on it was frustrating. So, I mean, that was kind of what I've been looking for for a while, medium format video. So just here, this is a comparison of, of size sensors. So at the top there, we have full frame, and then we have little diddly micro four thirds, and then the medium format of the Fuji GFX. I, I'm not gonna go into too much, into much detail about why medium format is so special. It's just, a, it's a different aesthetic for sure. With the right lenses, yes, you can get a, a, a shallow depth of field, but it's a, it's a, you can, you, in theory, you can get a shallower depth of field with full frame with the right lenses and distance and stuff. It's just a look. It's, it's, it's about the fall off that you get with medium format. It's a very beautiful, gentle fall off. It's lovely. And it, the, the amount of light that it soaks up, oh, it's just, it's just wonderful. And I just always wanted to see what a video would be like because I've never shot it, not in medium format. So this film, um, I'm going to talk about now. It could have been shot on anything, to be totally frank. Any, that, it, that, a camera is not the most important thing. You've probably been told this many times. The manufacturers probably won't say that. But you can, I could have used anything. I could have used my iPhone. I could have used a GoPro. It's, it just wouldn't have looked as good. For me, it's all about, there's a number of things that it comes down to when I'm choosing a camera. One of the most important things is how good is that image? That's 50% of it. The other 50% is, okay, what is this camera actually like to use? Is this gonna give me grief? Is it too heavy? Is it gonna deal with who I have the lenses for? All of these sort of things matter. So that's really what I look for in the camera. I mean, you may think that, that this is big. Not for me when it comes to video, not in the slightest. And I think I bought, this is much smaller, like, uh, weight and weight-wise smaller than the, the Pentax 645Z, which I, for three years, had around my neck. 
So whilst shooting video with a proper video camera as well. So what I look for camera is low light performance is important. As a documentary filmmaker, I need to be able to work in all sorts of light so it can work in a, lit, in a controlled lit environment to low light filming. I want um, the ability to get a shallow depth of field as well as a deep depth of field. So I want that ability. So a large sensor, so full frame is ideal um, or larger. Super 35 is fine. I've shot that for years. Um, what else I look for a camera? I mean, things like being waterproof, you know, rainproof is good. Uh, this slow motion is nice. Dynamic range, for sure. Uh, the internal recording is important, how good the internal recording is. Because whilst external monitors with recorders are, are great, they're not great if you want to be just walking, going around with it around your neck and being really minimal. That's for controlled setups and tripods and stuff. So that's kind of what I look for mostly in the camera. Oh, and audio, good audio. So that brings me on to uh, the island of Skiathos. Has anybody been there? Nobody, nobody is going to get my water, hold on. So it's a, uh, an island in Greece. Anybody been to Greece? Hey, anybody never heard of Greece? There will be some people watching who will be like, no. I've seen the musical with John Travolta. Is that the one? No. Skiathos is a very small island in the northern Aegean, which is, is going to come up in a second anyway. And it's a place I went to on holiday for the first time in 2015. And that's a photo uh, on the 645, Pentax 605Z uh, at about three in the morning, as you do. And, uh, and I just, it's the most beautiful island because it's, it's tiny, 12 kilometers across. It's not been spoilt too much by tourism. It's only open for five months a year. Seven months a year, there's no tourists. So it's, it's a very different sort of to the normal, traditional Greek sort of island. And I fell in love with it. And I, I travel a lot in my life in the world. Even on my holidays, I never go back to the same place. Never, until this. And I have been back every year since, multiple times, which is unheard of for me. Because I've always just said, there's so much of the world to see, why would I go back to the same place? And I do. So, Skathos. One of the key things that is important to me about Skathos is, can anybody guess? It begins with C and rhymes with rats. Yay, you got the calendar. Hey, nice. You, I think um, Harriet's in there, isn't she, in that one? Yeah. So I needed a holiday, I needed a holiday. Okay, and hang on, I missed a slide. That's the wrong way around. That should be there, cats. So I fell in love with the cats there. There's cats on every island in the Mediterranean. Every place in the Mediterranean is full of cats. And most of them are in a terrible state because there's no, nobody there to make sure they get neutered, to control the numbers, to get, make sure they're okay. So they just multiply and multiply and it's just awful and depressing. But on Skiathos, I was amazed that I, was, I walked down into the town and there was cat food along the wall, all along the wall. And all of these fat cats, and I was like, these are stray cats and look at them. I was amazed and I found out there was a charity there who not only tries to feed as many of the island's uh, strays as they can, they have a nutrient program which happens all year round and tries to keep the numbers down. And I thought this was amazing. And um, I went to meet them uh, a year or so later and I was surrounded by 200 cats, which was amazing. And I just thought, this, this, these people are amazing. What you do for free for the, to give your time for is amazing. And then I found out that they were in financial trouble. So I said, all right, I'm going to come over and because they're going to lose their land, uh, had no money to buy anywhere else. And that they needed to raise 150,000 euros. So I went over there to um, make a documentary, which is this one here. So that was January last year. And I made a, that documentary to tell the story of them and what they do. And then I went back a few months later, uh, made three more. It was supposed to be one. It was just too long to put as one. So I split it up into three. And it works as, kind of, as a series. And it works really well. And, um, and that's the cat I showed you with one eye. Um, she, uh, I met her whilst filming these, as well as my black cat, Jimmy the Greek. I adopted both Harriet and him after meeting them. So I have lots of cats now. Anyway, so 
I'm just trying to get you into what, how this all happened. So, that's the right slide now. I have actually filmed another documentary about skeletal so I haven't even edited yet. In, I shot it in April. It was about neutering. It's to educate people about the why the cats need to be neutered. I haven't edited it yet because I've been doing this massive project for my, a new masterclass teaching photographers how to shoot video. And three episodes are now out. I'm still editing it. And I've been in my edit suite so much of this year. And I needed to go on holiday. So where did I choose to go? Ski Athos, which is silly because I wasn't going to relax there because it's Ski Athos. Um, so the original idea was to, to shoot a little bit of video out there because I can't not. For me, photography and video, yeah, it, it's work in, in, in a sense, but it's also what I love to do. So I've, I have friends who say to me, look, why don't you just take a proper break and just don't take your camera with you? I'm like, w w why, why would I ever do, do that? That's an awful idea. I couldn't think of anything more upsetting and depressing because I would see something beautiful and I'd like, I can't take a photo of it. Just look at it with your eyes. Yeah, okay, it's lovely, but I wanna take a photo too, then I can look at it again and again and again and again. Hello. Just like again. Oh, that's very kind of you, thank you. Oh. I like the helpers here, they're good. So the original idea was to um, shoot uh, a little film, nothing long, Nothing, you know, maybe three minutes long. And I wanted to shoot it on the GFX 100. Because I wanted to shoot medium format video. I didn't own it. I just thought, meh, I'm gonna ask Fuji UK if they can let me borrow one. And they did. So they let me borrow one for two weeks. And I took, uh, 10 days actually, so I ran out of 10 days. And I started shooting with it. And it was beautiful. It was wonderful. So the original idea for me was to make a film which showed the two sides of the island through my eyes, which is the island, how I originally fell in love with it, which was the holiday islands, the island of fun, the island of beauty, the island of relaxation of great food and people and stuff. And then the other half, which is the cats, which is the, you know, the amount of time that I spend going around the island looking after the cats, feeding them and all that sort of stuff. It was just to be just like a little montage type thing, just split, going back and forth between it. And you can definitely see that in the actual film, because the actual film is 29 minutes long. It just sort of starts off a little bit like that, and then grows and grows and grows, because what happened was a story. Once I had a, suddenly had a story, which I was never intending to actually have a story, then, I, then it became much, much bigger. And I, it, the filming took on a, a totally different style. No, not really, no, it didn't really. The filming took on um, a more sp specific thing that I needed to get. Whereas before it was, I could have shot anything. But once I had a story, I had to focus on telling this story. And then it, yeah, I ended up t changing my 10 day holiday to two weeks to make sure that I, I was there. If, when you've seen the film, you'll understand because when this key moment happens in the film, that was right near the end of my holiday. And there's no way I could possibly have left to, to come home. And it is easily the most personal film I've ever made. It's definitely one of my favorites, if not my favorite thing I've ever made. It's, incre it, it's a very emotive film. It is, it is a documentary, but it's, it's not a documentary like you'd normally see. So my documentaries, my broadcast TV documentaries will have a presenter or they'll have narration. Uh, my personal documentaries, uh, all led by, all, all carried by interviews, by people talking with, there's no voiceover, and it's no presenter, it's done by, the story is told by the interviewees, which is actually one of my favorite ways of telling a documentary. It's much harder, because there's no script to help you out of those storytelling holes. You have to make sure that everybody says everything that you need to get. But this has none of that. It has some captions, but it's, there's no voice. I didn't want my voice, although you hear it a little bit. I didn't want any interviews. <clears throat> I wanted it to be the visuals and the sound and the music. This is the, open, uh, this is the film, Sharma Lipi. And it sums up, <clears throat> it's a great word. It's a Greek word uh, that means a feeling of joy and happiness at the same time. 
it's not like being really happy and then suddenly, oh, the happiness has gone now. It's constantly there. It's a constant feeling of joy and happiness. You pop, you, you, everybody would have experienced it in different times. It's, it's so mixed. It's like, it's, for me, it's being in this place which feels like my home, but make, makes me incredibly sad as well because of the experiences I've had there with, with the cats and stuff. It's, be, it's, it's, a really, it's a really weird feeling, and it's pretty much there the whole time. And that's little, me hoarding little Kevin, and that's right at the end of the airport runway there, which is where the charity was based. They've actually lost their land now, but uh, they've raised enough money to buy somewhere, which is good. Here's the opening to the film. I told you why the GFX, because I, I wanted to use it. So, the main features of this camera, it's medium format, which means it's a 1.7 times more surface area than full frame. That seems to have lost a couple of letters there. Uh, 4K, I wanted it to be 4K, forgot about that features. 4K up to 30p. There's no crop of the sensor, apart from the top and bottom, because it's 16 by nine. It records internally at 10 bits, I'll go into more of that in a minute. It has in-body uh, in image stabilization. It has phase detection autofocus, and it has good low-light performance. Here's the A7R three versus the uh, GFX five. You've already seen a comparison photo, didn't you see that? And this is if you, you want to see how it actually looks like sensor size. So there's what you, you know you do with the APS-Cs and stuff. And big medium format is the extra one there. But uh, GFX shoots what's called the cropped medium format. OK, 10-bit. Who, who knows what 10-bit is? Good. So you can just have a little quick look on social media or something whilst I just cover this. So 10-bit is, um, is how we want it to be recorded rather than 8-bit. And it's about the amount of uh, different uh, shades of, of the colors that you can have in the recording. So it's 256 per um, channel in 8-bit, and it's four times that in 10-bit. And it just means, what it actually means to your image is it holds up much, much better. Now, 
8-bit is fine if you correctly expose things. You can't underexpose 8-bit, really. And it, j it starts falling apart. So for example, um, when I was filming this, I never set out to make something long. I had two, t two hard drives with me, so one hard drive and then a backup of four terabytes. And I got to maybe day nine, and I was at like 320 gigabyte, uh, yeah, three, 320, ter sorry, 3.2 terabytes. And it's a four terabyte drive, and I was like, oh my god, I'm going to run out of space, and I can't kill my backup. So I stupidly switched to a lower, uh, to a more compressed format and 8-bit. Huge mistake, because the image degraded a lot. So this is what you want. You, if you are using this camera, you select H.265. You, you will struggle to edit with this, so you convert it in post. Don't use H.264 because it is 8-bit. So um, at least you get to see one plane going over. Now, look at the sky. Can you see it? So <clears throat> par partly I'm underexposed, but also um, it's 8-bit and it's a solid sky and it hates it. And as I crop in, you'll see it really clearly. You've probably all seen banding on stills photos when you put them online and on social media and stuff because they're highly compressed. But you don't want to start off with it looking like this. If it ends up like that online, which it will do on YouTube anyway, by the time it gets online, it will still look like, well, not as bad as that, but it will, won't look great. You always want to start off in the highest quality possible. So this is 10-bit. So uh, it, it, uh, it doesn't, it's, again, you're still going to get it pretty well exposed. But if you've got a, a stronger format to start with, then you can do more with it in post, especially if you're going to start with a, a log flat profile. Anyway, so one of the nicest things about the Fuji are the pitch profiles. Now, you can shoot log, and you can shoot one of the film stocks. One of the nicest, or well, the film stock that I tend to shoot with if I'm not shooting log, which is quite often, is the Eterna profile. And it's lovely. So they, I don't know if you know this, Fuji actually make film. Um, so this is all, I mean, this is a cinema. All the other film stocks are for, uh, for, for stills, as opposed to for video, uh, for film, sorry. But uh, the Eternal one is a beautiful one. And I just, I love the look of it. It's very soft, it holds dynamic range. It's really nice. But you could do that in post, because you can just download a, a LUT, a lookup table. So you could shoot in log, which is here. Can, uh, here's I'm set to recording in, in the flat log profile. And then you can, gr you can add the Eterna profile on top of it. So this is Eterna. It's, it's not supposed to be green. I don't know if it looks orange on there. The sky, sunsets aren't green. They're not. So this is the flat log profile. And then you'll see me put it into Eterna in post. So the same thing. It's just. Um, it's, I, the, when you look at the film, it actually is graded to a turner. So there is a small, there is a, a bit of a benefit to shooting log, in that it will hold a bit more dynamic range, but not that much more. So you could just shoot a turner. It's still 10 bit. I just love the turner look. I think it's beautiful. And if you're taking photos, um, you know you have when you take a photo with a Fuji camera, any of the Fuji cameras, you have all these film stocks. You should be shooting RAW anyway. When you bring in your RAW, like into Lightroom, Lightroom will disregard what you shot it with. You just need to go back into the, the image settings in Lightroom and select your film stock, and then it'll bring it up. But if you shoot JPEG, uh, your JPEG will be baked in. So anyway, and with video, it's baked in. There's no RAW. So lenses, I, sh I kept it really simple. I shot with two lenses. I shot with the, four, the uh, 45 millimeter and the 110. Two lenses, that's all. And that equates to full frame focal length of 85 and 35 f. So that's it. I didn't have a fifth. I did have a 50 equivalent, which is 63. I just didn't use it. I also had my wide angle, the 23. Um, I used it one shot. And then I was like, eh, no. I also, had, I also bought a big telephoto. Nah, didn't use it. Just kept it really simple, um, and 
even though I brought loads of gear out with me, I left it all behind. It was just went out, kept it really, really simple. And I had one stills tripod with me. That was all. OK, autofocus versus manual focus. Now, the reason why I wanted autofocus, part of it was because I'm, I was going to be in it. Now, when you see the film, I, whilst I am in it, you don't really see me properly. And you see my face like twice in it. It's, I'm out of focus. I, it's the back of me. It's, uh, or, or the back of me in focus, back of me out of focus. It's me in the frame somewhere or in the distance. So I'm in it. So the autofocus is very useful because obviously I'm not there to check it. It doesn't always work perfectly. Um, I'm not getting into whole autofocus, autofocus talk. It's, it's a bigger topic. We talked about it a little bit yesterday. For me, autofocus is a, is a great tool. And for me to, com to use it, I need to 100% trust it. And there's, uh, there's a couple of cameras. Uh, actually, the, the new Sony cameras are amazing. And I trust them 97%. And the Canon ones, I probably trust about 94, 95%. Depends on the lenses. Fuji is, isn't as good, their autofocus. It is still good. It's one of the best. Uh, but it's not quite as good there. And it's, I think it still needs a few more firmware updates to get it up and running. It's better, but it is actually pretty damn good. Uh, but there are times when it doesn't work so well. So manual focus is one of these things that is, when I'm doing anything that's set up, then it's manual focus. Anything that's not moving, it's manual focus. Because there's no reason for it to be autofocus. Um, for some reason, this, this shot here, um, I'm going to show you, I did shoot an autofocus. And I don't know why I did that. Because it was a locked off shot of the ho front of the hotel of me working my way down. There was, no, there was no reason for it to be autofocus, but for some reason I'd left it in autofocus. And what it was doing was it was pulsing, which is what it can do sometimes. And that's down to the sensitivity of the settings. It needs to be dialed down. And so it's, I don't know why it didn't think it was in focus, but it just didn't think it was in focus. And so it started moving. So look at the, um, the clip here, and just look at the edge of the frame. And you can just see it slightly changing if it's going to play. Yeah. which was really annoying when I got back and, sh and saw that. I only saw that when I got back home. I didn't see it when I, otherwise I would have reshot it. But um, I fixed it in post because it's not the, fo the focus itself didn't actually change. It was just the image size was changing slightly. So I used warp stabilizer and it fixed it. And it fixed, it, and it happened on a number of other shots. But it, again, all it was doing, it wasn't going out of focus. It was just, the motor was just making slight movement and making, because the lenses are not what's called, um, well, they, they breathe, basically. The, if the lens, uh, if there was no focus breathing on the lenses, like a cinema lens, even if it was doing that, you wouldn't see it. Because it focus, all these lenses focus breathe, which means they, when you change the focus to be closer, it looks like you're zooming slightly. So that's why I did that. Now, the in-body image stabilization is not a replacement for a Steadicam or a gimbal or stuff. It is for shooting generally handheld. Uh, a lot of them are terrible when you're walking. People try to walk with, with IBIS, it looks terrible. Um, for me, it's about handheld shooting. It's about, the, because it's using a CMOS sensor, was one of the things that really worried me is the problem with CMOS sensors is they, have a rolling, they use rolling shutter to capture the image. And depending on how fast the readout is of that sensor, you can get some really wobbly looking stuff. And we've dealt with this since the 5D Mark II days. And whilst that's what the GFX 50S had video, or has video, but the, the rolling sensor readout is so slow, unless you are filming something which is not moving and your camera is locked down on the tripod, then you're fine. If anything moves, it's wibbly wobbly, wavy wobbly wobbly, which is not good at all. And it, the readout from this is amazing. It's so much faster. I was shocked at how much better it is. But even you know, when you're doing handheld, if you have vibrations from holding it, I mean, when you are shooting handheld, having a viewfinder helps a lot because it's all about points of contact. So normally I would have one, two, three, four. Five points of contact. And the most important thing when shooting handheld, what is it? What is it? 
the successful sh way to shoot handheld, what do you need to do? We all need to do it to live. But many people in shooting handheld, trying to keep steady, do this. They hold their breath. And the other thing you don't want to do is tense up. Don't turn yourself into a tripod. You turn yourself into a tripod and you'll start shaking. So uh, don't drink too much coffee. Again, that will bring through. And the Ibis will fix that. Ibis fixes too much coffee. Uh, the best handheld, actually, going back to Canon days, so I got used to this horrible micro vibrations that you'd get from the, gel, from the rolling shutter, and I hated it. But I was shocked because I filmed with the Canon 7D in 2009 in Dublin, and the handheld was the most beautiful handheld and stable handheld I'd ever shot with a Canon. And I, and I was trying to think, why does this look so good? And then I'd realized I'd been drinking. So my body was relaxed, naturally, naturally relaxed. Not, that's debatable. It was relaxed. It wasn't deliberate, put it that way. I'd had a couple of gin and tonics, and my God, my, I was like a steady cam. I was incredible. I didn't even know. But don't do that, everybody. I know if you can't have to say, oh, Philip Bloom says, this means I don't have to save up money for a gimbal. I can just go get drunk instead, and I can get super steady shots. It's not about that. It's about removing that vibration that you can see through there. So, I have drones, and if you look at my previous films from Skiathos, they have beautiful drone shots, and some really cool shots of um, bird's eye view of, of the car winding its way around. It looks amazing. But that's not, I wanted this to be tr purely G, um, GFX 100. So all the car shots, everything is with this, and what I did with the car shots is, I, using my stills tripod, I bungeed it up in the back of the Jeep, and either using the 45mm lens or the 110, focusing on the uh, rear view mirror, used it, and hoped that it would turn out okay, because those roads aren't good. They're terrible on this island. I mean, there's nothing smooth about them. But it turned out well, I'll show you. See how stable it is, it just looks great. And if that, if the Ibis wasn't there, it would have been, because it was, it was the worst Jeep ever. I mean, it was, well, it was Suzuki Jimny. It, I have, I should just buy one and leave it there because the amount of money I've wasted on the worst rental cars ever there, that was the, the vibration everywhere on that, but it worked well. So I shot handheld and tried, but half and half. So everything from my personal viewpoint was handheld and then everything of me. So, so uh, first person, handheld. Third person, tripod. And you can't really um, do handheld of yourself if you're in it, can you? Unless you're gonna do the, which is not the style that I was going for. If I'm over there and I wanna shoot it handheld, I've got a problem. I don't know how to solve that problem unless I learn how to use the force and then you're like, it's just floating around you and stuff. Maybe. It's possible. I suppose a better drones will at some point come in with a handheld mode. Actually, just use an old, a really crappy old drone without a gimbal. There's handheld mode for you at a distance, all over the place. Crappy there. That'd be great. Anyway, that's the styles I use. It was nice and simple, no panning, no, everything was locked off and it was great. Here's some, a nice clip for you. This is right, uh, right at the beginning. So this is on a long lens. It's still, you know, it's, the Ibis is actually really good. It's almost too steady at times. We bring up the music a bit.
I took the I took the GFX into the sea quite a lot. It wasn't mine. No, but it was, I did the same with the Pentax. Uh, it's just it's so calm the water, and the only thing you need to be worried about is kids splashing. So just make sure you don't get anywhere kids splashing, and any boats which are going to cause some wake. So I just go in, go in with um, just a you know like a waterproof uh, thing, a rain cover for anything which you get with your think tank bags. And I just held just held it in that, and you get these amazing shots. So now the camera is just just above the water level, and it just looks beautiful. Looks such lovely shots you can get. Uh, I'm going to show you another clip here. So. Um, as the, as the film progresses, you, I'm introducing you to introduce you to one cat there. And the way you tell a story is a, a bigger story is through smaller is, is through uh, characters. So, and the characters in this film are there's two cats and there's parts of the island. So the characters aren't people as such. One of the characters is the town, but the, the two of the main characters are two cats. So I'm telling the story through them of quite a one that one thing that happens to one is accidental probably and the other one is deliberate and it's about a serious a very serious story about how our animals are treated so it's that's why the film starts off very gentle uh, then becomes much harder to watch as it goes through and so when I, I mean, this is this is true so this is what happens when I go out um, in Skathos for dinner with friends and stuff is I'll have my bag on me with a couple of lenses and then I'll have a second bag strapped onto that full of cat treats and food and stuff. And so we're walking along and then my friends turn around and I'm not there because I stopped. I've seen the cat, I'm feeding the cats. And I've seen another cat, I'm feeding the cats. All right, cut, all right, all right we're, we're, you know where you're going, Phil? Yeah, I'll meet you there. So I eventually get there because they get fed up with waiting. There, that's pretty much me. And the thing is with Greece is they have these calendars and all these things you can buy with Greek cats on it. But at the end of the day, most people there don't actually like them. They are, not everybody, there are some, but it's the way that they're treated during the tourist season for the tourists is very different to the way that they're treated when the tourists all leave. Uh, it's got a lot better, but what used to happen until recently is hotel owners would, as soon as it closed down, they'd just put poison food down to kill all the cats. And this happens, still happens, it still happens in so many of these places. Not on Skathos, it is, a, it is against the law and they, if they're caught, they can get huge fines in prison, but if they get caught, so. So this is the moment when the story changed, part, and the story, you know, it's, it's, it is a very gradual, the film is, it gradually happens, but there's one moment about 11 minutes in where things change. And this is where you meet the second character. Calm down. Okay. He's really I put okay. him in the. I put him in the back. In the big. Okay. And in the morning we'll see how he goes and sedate him to have X-rays to take the spine out. So, um, just going on to the technical side again. So, any real issues with the camera itself? Is using it? 
Other than that pulsing of the autofocus, no. No, I mean, it was just a joy. The screen on the back is really bright and angles. The EVS, so I use, um, and I think this is a set, actually, here, there is one awkward thing, apart from, not, apart from not having another hand. Let me just angle this. So 95% of the audio was recorded in camera using the, the Rode Video Micro. Uh, there's a little bit of stuff with an external audio, which uh, I use the Zoom H2, the little one, with a stereo shotgun just to get waves and stuff. So I, was, I just plonked it in the, um, the sand and just recorded like half an hour of beach noise and wave noise just for underlay at times. The only downside to the, uh, this EVF is essential. So the EVF comes with it, but the, uh, the angling adapter doesn't. And it's just because I, got, uh, I need reading glasses um, and also to be more stable, you want to use the EVF. Uh, if it's, you want to get a low shot, which I was going to get, it's cats. They, they're going to be low shots. Um, this is great, but the microphone, go. <laughs> it's directional, so that's the one tiny thing. But um, yeah, this means you can shoot so, so easily with this EVF. It's like 350 euros or something like that. Uh, it doesn't match the color of this, but this is from my 50s, but who cares? It's the most essential accessory I think you can get for the GFX. So there's no real issues. It just worked brilliantly. Um, it's a high quality codec. It takes up a fair bit of space. Um, I just loved shooting video with it. It was a joy, absolute joy. And taking photos as well, because I could just flick a switch and take photos. Just like that, not a different camera, not another camera with another lenses. It was all in the same thing. I'd take some photos, I'd shoot some video. I guess the only real issue was, my God, I used up so much hard drive space with the stills being, if you, you shoot, even shooting compressed RAW, uh, which is still 16-bit, you end up with a raw photo of 210 megabytes. I did, I did shoot one time lapse, uh, and I thought, I can't do any more of these. This is going to fill up my hard drives crazily. And then I tried to build them. Oh my god, nightmare. Like, you know, would using a Sony a7 III be easier? Certainly in weight wise, but otherwise, I don't know how well it have worked in the car, to be honest with you. I think the car things for me was amazing, how well it worked in those driving shots. But um, it's just that for me, uh, what I loved about the look of this, it feels like moving photographs, which is what I love about the look of the, the video from the GFX 100. And that's something quite special. Um, I don't want to play that. I want to just play one other clip, which I need to get from. I had it in, in the other t thingy. We can leave that on. It doesn't look too messy, does it? I want clip. It was in my other presentation, but uh, it, uh, that's all gone now. So I want to play you clip six, no, five. Here we go. So one last clip for you. I'm not going to play anything sad. I just end up with something pretty. You see the switch from third person tripod, first person, me, handheld, watching them. I did some shots where I, the focus tracked me, but I thought this was way nicer. Because at the end of the day, it's not about me, it's about them. So they're the focus of this. To that first keynote because it's got the photos, the new photos that I did. So fingers crossed that should be fine and then we're done. It's all the way down to here. Okay, so the photos are made. I love taking photos as I said and the quality of the photos is incredible. 
it's too much for everything, to be totally frank with you. You export a full resolution JPEG, Instagram won't even take it now. They used to, take, but then now they, it all comes up corrupted on the, when you put, try and upload it. But the great thing about it is you are able to crop to the most amazing extent. You know, I've had the first high resolution stills camera I got was the Canon 5D SR, 51 megapixels. But when you cropped in, you saw so much noise. It was like, ugh. So it wasn't great. Whereas these are great. I mean, this is, look, it's me. It's a selfie. See, did you know that that was a selfie? No, that is a selfie. See? It's a proper selfie, that is. Amazing that you could have that. Here's another, this is a panorama in the water. So there's quite a few photos, and I just stitched them in post. But look, man, you can just, just, just stupid. It's amazing. I don't know what I would do. You know, again, it's this, even one photo, you could print, probably this, and it'll cover the roof of this building, and it would look amazing. You could walk along, like, whoa, look at the detail. I'd like that, but I don't have a printer big enough. Uh, this is a photo of, of Severus. It's just look at that beautiful look. It's just the fall off of that 110mm lens is beautiful. I mean, come on, look at the detail. It's just ridiculous and just the most beautiful looking. The, what it doesn't have, like the, the Sony's, the new Sony's have, is the uh, eye autofocus for animals, which I got them to put in there. I actually met, I had a meeting in, I went over there to Japan with Sony HQ, met up with all the, the big wigs and they were asking for suggestions of what the cameras should have. And, and there were, all these people say, oh, it needs to have 10 bit, blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, can you get the eye autofocus to work on cats? And they went, is that important? Yeah, and dogs as well and other animals, but I think it would be really good. Do you think you could do that? And they went, mm, yeah. And a year and a half later, firmware came out. Great. Um, like, because most times you do autofocus of animals, you think you got it. It's mostly their nose you get in focus. So what I've always done previously is I, I would you know, do a center box tracking, a center box focus, and then reframe to try and get, because all of my photos tend to be here in focus. So, and I ha it does the same with the GFX to a point. So you just got to be quite careful. But it uh, depends how much you want to crop. If you don't crop too much, you don't know. And there's Bonnie, that's Nino, and Anita's cat there. And that's really high, that's 6400 ISO, and it's so good. It just looks great, and she looks great. And there you go. I did have some other photos, but that'll do. So um, you can download this video from my Vimeo channel. Um, you can watch it on YouTube, but it's just compressed. It's ProRes, I, 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 put, I put up a ProRes version on Vimeo, so you can watch it there. And you can go to uh, my Flickr, flickr.com slash Philip Bloom, and there's loads of photos uh, with the, um, the GFX100 from this trip, which you can download and zoom in crazily and go, whoa, look at the detail there. So just be careful if you are taking photos of you know, your partner, whatever it is, um, if you're using a high resolution camera, because if you put that high resolution image up online, somebody could crop into that, an eyeball and see that you're naked when you took that photo. And that's never going to be good, is it? Warning there. You don't take photos, so you're all right.